Hello and welcome back to Power Sessions with Natasha where we find our confidence, our power and where we have real conversations. Today we are continuing with our theme of Africa's Queens and we are going all the way to my country of birth. We are going back to Zimbabwe today, all the way down to Southern Africa. Yay! And today we are talking about Mboyani Handa. Mboyani Handa, many of us, especially if you're Zimbabwean, have grown up hearing stories about her. I know that some places um, in Africa and African people, they have heard about her. And her famous words are, My bones shall rise. So, who is Mboyani Handa? Um... Nehanda is actually a spirit, what we call in Shona Eshikiro, or spirit media of the Zezuru Shona people. Um, she's a Shona Mondoro, and Mondoro is, is a powerful, respected, ancestral spirit. Um, it's, it's something that is very, very, you know, respected in the Shona um, culture. They call it a royal muzimu, an ancestral spirit, or a lion spirit that uses women as her mediums. The mediums are normally given the, the name or the title Nehanda, Ombuya Nehanda. Mondoro spirits were very revered spirits among the Shona. Um, it was believed that they could interpret the orders and wishes of Mwari. Mwari is a senior deity, which is like God. The original Nehanda was considered to be Nyamita, the daughter of the first Monomotapa Mutota who was living in the north of Gurue in about 1430. The funny thing is my grandmother on my dad's side is from Gurue and um, it's very ironic that all of this started uh, near there. Mutota was the father, was the founder of the Mutapa state. He, has a, he had a son called Mutope who later became the second Mono Mutapa. Mut Matope was Nyamita's younger half-brother and to increase the power of Matope, Mutota ordered his son to sleep with his older half-sister Nyamita, who became widely known as Nehanda. The ancestral ritual is believed to have resulted in the increase of Matope's rule and empire. Matope handed over a part of his empire to Nehanda, who became so powerful and well-known that her spirit lived on in the human bodies of various spirit mediums until almost 500 years later, when it was believed to occupy the body of the Mazoe Nehanda, who we are going to discuss today. During periods of possession, the spirit medium was believed to be speaking with the voice and personality of the original Nehanda and not with their own. Wow. So let's look at the Nehanda that we are going to talk about today. The Nehanda we are looking at today is, her name was Charwe Nyakasikana. Um, and famously, she's known as Mbuya Nehanda, you know. So Mbuya Nehanda was a spirit medium that was channeled by Charwe Nyakasikana, she was a Hera of the Watamfokese dynasty. Um, Hera is like a, a part of the Shona people, Shona group, part of the Shona tribe, the Zezuru people. Charwe Nyakasikana was born in 1840 in what is today the Chishawasha district, which is located in Mashonaland Central. She was the daughter of a named man Chitaura, who was the younger son of Shayachimwe. Shayachimwe founded the Wata dynasty in the upper Mazoe Valley in the late 18th century. By 1896, though, the Chitara name was held by um, her brother, whom she lived with, and she was considered to be much more important than him, probably because of her spiritual powers. She had actually been married and had two daughters and a son, but the name of her husband was not recalled or cannot be remembered historically. She probably became possessed by the Nehanda spirit in 1884 because um, her brother's stronghold at that time, in terms of war, was named Nehanda. So, what happened with Nehanda? What is, you know, why is it that now she is this revered uh, woman, she's this revered person in history for fighting for her people? Well, Nehanda was um, eventually killed by the British, but why? So when the British came in um, in the, in the so-called Rhodesia, but now it's obviously Zimbabwe, um, in 1890, they immediately instituted a regime of rough justice, 
they took over the local people's land, mines, the, the cattle, everything was to do with taxes, paying taxes. It was horrific. On top of that, the local people were forced to work for the English pioneer settlers on their newly acquired farms, mines, factories, under very, very harsh conditions. It was obviously they're not surprising that in less than six years of British colonial rule, the local people rose up in arms and declared a bitter war on the colonial settlers. That declaration of war on the settlers by the people took the British completely by surprise. The British were asking themselves how could people that they had always considered docile and cowardly suddenly declare war. They then thought out what is the issue. They believed that the bad influence of the Mondoros or the Shikiro the spirit mediums, which, they, which the British referred to as witch doctors, had everything to do with the rebellion. Notice the word witch doctors, the, 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 the demonizing of our culture. You know, these people, the Mondoros, the Shikiros, were, were people who we consulted for generations upon generations. But once the British arrived, they called them witch doctors. And that word witch doctors till today take so much power away from the power of our ancestors and give so much power to that word and it just de demonizes our own traditions anyway carrying on the british believed that the mondoros did not want whites in rhodesia hence the spirit mediums were urging people to chase every British settler out. That is what they believed. It had to be these spiritual people. It had to be these, these people who speak with the gods, who influence the people. They knew when they came there that these people who were the Mondoros, the Shikiros, were actually where the community, the sense of people's identity came from. This is where people took their direction from. So they thought, if we attack those people, we will get the best results. So... It was obviously not surprising when they targeted the spirit mediums for murder. Particularly Mbia Nehanda. She was falsely accused of murdering the native commissioner of her district. His name was Henry Howland Poland, who in fact had been killed in battle. So let's go into history and go, what happened? How was she involved in all of this, in the battles and everything? So, Wata Chiripanyanga was a chief of the Wata dynasty in 1892. He was an ally of Nehanda. He played a leadership role in the first Chimringa War of Southern Rhodesia in June 1896. He worked with Mbuya Nehanda to organize resistance by the Wata people against British settlers who had invaded their lands at Pagomba in Mazoe Valley. Wata lost the lives of a hundred fighters in guerrilla-type battles with the British settlers, losing more than they had triumphed, but the triumph of the Wata people was short-lived. The British reorganized and returned to Mazo with many soldiers to re-establish control. The British hunted down the leaders of the rebellion. British soldiers went from village to village where they shot and killed any males that fled. They burned several villages and huts and stole cattle and grain. The purge went on for three months. And to save their people, Mambowata, ne Ambuya Nehanda, and Mashi came out from hiding and surrendered to the police. You will find out who Mashi is in a moment. There are, however, three important factors to kind of look at when you're looking at the whole Ambuya Nehanda situation um, with her role in the Chiburenga. Firstly, is that the different Shona rulers and their people had to make very rapid decisions when the news of the Chimringa arrived, you know. The, the, the central Shona rising began in the second week of June in the middle um, Mupure Valley, Valley, mainly as a response to the news of the Ndebele victories. So, in the Mazoe Valley, the news arrived on the 17th of June and fighting started the next day. On June 20, it began at Chipadze, 60 kilometers downriver from the water center. On, on 25th of June, it reached down of Mount Darwin, right? So, for Wata, Mbuya Nehanda, and all the other leaders of the Upper Mazowe, a serious political decision had to be made. If, do we fight or do we not? What do we do? So they decided to fight. Of course they were going to fight. You understand? Secondly, we have to look at evidence that, um, you know, was 
put into the trial that you know the the, the at the beginning of the rising um there is the, the Gombere Shumba, the medium of the Kaguvi spirit, was very influential in certain areas, certain areas like Chivero, Nyamweda, Jimba, and Eastern Salisbury, or Salisbury District, which, you know, this Kaguvi spirit had such influence in telling people that we must fight, we must fight the British. So when it came to court, they said that, well, the spirit mediums were influencing people to kill the British. They were influencing people to do this. So, hence, the Pollard killing for which Mbiani Handa was hanged took place a fortnight after the outbreak. It was a consequence of the wars, but not the cause. She wasn't the cause. During the fighting, a combination of rumours and assumptions led the Rhodesians to believe that Mbiani Handa had played a major part so by the time she was captured, her guilt was assumed. Thirdly, on the killing of Paula, Chari claimed that she had not ordered his death. You know, they called they called Mbiani Handa Chari in the in the legal documents. Mbiani Handa had never ever ordered his death. But obviously, the people who were tri- at the trial were mostly British people. They said that she had, but there was no evidence in the physical participation in the rebellion which killed many British people. However, they were tried for the murder of this man called Pollard and some African uh, police officers who worked for the British um, and they were sentenced to death. So remember I said to you, you will find out who Mashi is. Mashi was a um, a British soldier who was of Zimbabwean descent, but he worked for the for the British army. He had deserted the British army to join the rebellion at Mazoe. He was surprisingly pardoned for exemplary behavior after his arrests, which obviously tells us that he was a spy for the British, and he indeed sold out Mbiani Handa and her party to the British. And so Mbiani Handa was taken to the gallows, on 27th April 1898. It is interesting though to note that um, Judge Watermeyer, who is the man who instructed her hanging, he instructed that Mbiani Handa was to be hanged by the neck until that until she died, right? But it is told that Mbiani Handa actually did not die by hanging. You understand? Uh, what actually happened was Mbuyane Handa was blindfolded and shot dead by a squad of white officers. And in oral tradition, a lot of people said that um, Mbuyane Handa, you know, was shot in Majoni. In, 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 in Shona, we say Majoni. Um, and it's it's so sad because, you know, it wasn't the way that she should have died. It was She shouldn't have died for that. And in a lot of you know, Zimbabwean tradition, we hear, you know, it's the way that she died. So where is she buried? That is the very interesting thing about this whole story as well. So the British created a cemetery in Harare. And that cemetery is west of Mpeza Namo Flea Market near the hostels and near, it's near Rufaro Stadium. Um, It was opened on 2nd January 1893. The cemetery was divided according to race and religion as well as military background. Black people had their own section, which was to the west, um, called the native section. section. Then there were... There are two areas that were marked there. Two of the Africans buried there were of Mbuya Nyanda and Sekuru Kaguri of the first Jimrenga. It is interesting to note that not only are Sekuru Kaguri and Mbuya Nyanda buried um, at that cemetery, which is not closed, but also Judge Watermeyer, the man who said Mbuya Nyanda's death, is also buried there. And supposedly, the man who in fact hung or executed Mbuya Nyanda and Sekuru Kaguri, he is also buried there. However, there is one lasting disturbing thing that breaks my heart is the fact that the remains of Mbuyane Anda and Sekuru Kaguri are still in the United Kingdom. They are being kept as war trophies in London museums. They are expected to be repatriated, but when 
It was due to be done this year in 2020. We are still in 2020. And they, there's over 25 skulls of our revolutionaries that are being held in museums. For what? Mriani and Sekuruka Gubi were hanged in 1899 at the height of the white colonial occupation, which they fierce, fearlessly fought against. Their remains are still at Westminster Abbey and the National Hero Museums in both in London. It has been about 40 years, more than 40 years, since we got our independence. And we still haven't brought back the skulls of our icons. And our culture rightly says if a person dies or is killed in a native land, that person can only rest if the body and soul has been united with their roots. It is absolutely incredible that when you go in and you do the research, you find out that there are about 27 heads that were taken and gifted to the British crown as war medals. Heads. We need to take back the remains of our ancestors so that we can reunite their skulls with their roots because they belong at home. Many people might just think that the skulls are not important, that they are, but they are important. And the, the funny thing is that the, the colonialists, they knew that if they, if they take the head, that they have disconnected the connection between the body and the head and the person will not become a spirit medium. We need the heads of our ancestors to leave these colonial shores and return back home to rest in peace and continue blessing our lands. It is needed. And yet, we have gone through another amazing queen, Mbuya Nyanda. I urge you to go and look up about her. She's an amazing woman. So much history out there, guys, for us to learn and know who we are. We come from kings and queens. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you on the next one.